are Squawking Dead, a podcast pulverizing episodes of the Walking Dead universe. Sometimes we bring you news, sometimes we make you laugh, most times we go deep. I'm Cosmo Mom 9 Rachel B. With me is Sharon D., the lazy gardener, and we are so, so excited to welcome a very special guest to our show today. She is Dharma Freedom Finkelstein Montgomery on ABC's Dharma and Greg. She is our beloved June Dory on AMC's Fear the Walking Dead, and she's the better half of the Kicking and Screaming podcast. Jenna, thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. You changed my life. You replied to a random fan. And because of that, I am in this fandom. I have this amazing family. I have my bestie, Rachel. And I mean, I'm here talking to you. This is literally like a dream come true. And I just wanted you to know that what you do matters and you make a difference. You Thank made a you. huge difference to me. You've made a huge difference to me too. All your support and enthusiasm and awesome posts and edits and just all <laughs> that interest and celebration of what we're all creating is just, it, it means so much. And it was so nice meet, when, that I got to meet you that day. I, that um, was great, yes. It was super fun and to watch, for me to watch your face that first day it was sort of your first experience of entering this kind of world and to watch how much you've created within it it makes me very proud of you too and i'm just so glad that you've found a community that like you get to share all of these in common interests that light you up and i just think it's really cool so it makes me happy to watch you flourish thank you and thank you for everything three cheers for, for blazy gardener sharon do <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely without, without whom none of this would be possible friendship interviews thank you guys lovely projects and trivia of course oh, trivia. all the fun games we play i love your mind <laughs> thank you you guys but no the way you guys analyze and see all the details <laughs> it adds like this third dimension for for me i'll be reading the scripts or like you know i'll get the episodes and i'm watching something and i'll be like oh sharon she's, <laughs> she's gonna get a lot of <laughs> you know, it's like you do really fill up our world. Thank you. So. We feel seen. Yeah, no <laughs> yeah, yeah. kidding. Jenna, you are so incredibly inspiring, especially to me. I mean, growing up, watching Dharma embrace who she is, all the weird and the quirkiness, it really let me be comfortable with who I am. And I am totally comfortable being weird now. And, you know, I tell my son, I tell, call him a weirdo all the time. And his response is, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And Good that answer. all started with Dharma. You know, <laughs> you may, gave me confidence. So thank you. <laughs> wow, man, that is really, really awesome. And, and that's super in alignment with my goals, too. So I'm glad to hear it's landing and helping and things that I like to portray or exude or put out into the world or actually, you know, making an effect um, in a positive way. That's like everything I care about. So that uh, makes me really happy. It definitely, definitely. Is. Well, you definitely inspire us. Who inspires you? Everybody, really. Since I was a little kid, my mom, she would get embarrassed by how much I stared at people because I was always super curious. I'm so interested in humanity. I just love people watching, but with no judgment. I love watching human beings navigate the world around them. And so I take inspiration from everything in the process of developing a character or shifting through nuances of a character, like how June's gone through so many nuances or keeping the faith, whatever project I'm working on or wherever my headspace might be at in life in areas that like I want to adjust within myself individually or personally. I'm obviously inspired by the great people of the world like we all are. Muhammad Ali to Eleanor Roosevelt to whoever, Lucille Ball. There's people who inspire me creatively, but there's people who inspire me that are just everyday folk that I run into in the bathroom at Target. I talk to everybody and people tend to open up and start telling me their story. And it's incredible. And that inspires me hearing people overcome things in their life and things that were like these huge debilitating squashing issues for them. And then they found some purpose that just pulled them out and persevered. I love that. That inspires me. I'll go home and I look at my life differently because of hearing or observing someone who has done something cool or used some courage or whatever. So really everybody inspires me in some way, you know, even if you learn from other people's mistakes or you see something that's like, ugh. <laughs> 
that's inspiring because it reminds you that you have that within you too and you don't want to do that and it can prevent you from having unbecoming moments yourself because you actually see it in action in someone else and i think the examples of others good and bad all seek to inspire us and align our concepts of living. It's kind of funny because I, I I find myself saying this on the show a lot, that I love humans, I love people, I love observing them unjudgmentally. And with tandem with what you're saying, I feel like the truest way to inhabit a character is to see all these things, and then you can actually do it honestly. Yeah, you can't play mm-hmm. like a bad guy and then, ju- you know, like Virginia, say, if we're talking about fear. Colby never judged Virginia. She totally understood where her mindset was at and and leaned into that. I think when we are judging, it's probably because we're guilty of ourselves of some quality, you know, that we're like, Ugh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> mm-hmm. yes, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, is- it's another thing we say on the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we usually sing it too now. You hate in others what you hate in yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all that pot calling the kettle black. It's all the above. It's all in that basket. So, Jenna, when you take on a role and you become this character, how much of yourself, if any, do you sink into that character that you are playing? It's a funny chicken in the egg, I think, because obviously I'm the one playing it. So there's not like blank slate, but you are creating a character as their own person. I don't think too much about how much I have of myself. I try to just be a person and which person is that person, is that character with those experiences, thinking those thoughts. And there's different you know, schools of thought in terms of acting and such where you can be thinking about your laundry in the scene and if you have a distaste about the laundry you can transfer that emotion into that person that because it's a similar essence (laughs) i find that a little bit like schizo for myself i just prefer to really really understand the story and really understand as much as i can about this character in terms of what the writers are presenting what the goals of the producers you know in terms of the long game whatever information i can gather and then in terms of like personal things you know like like let's say June and the loss of her daughter Rose. What the loss of a child? As a mother, I know what the love is and that's the heartbreak. I don't put myself like in that scene at the cabin, I'm sitting with John in the episode Laura and I turn to him and say, I lost my daughter. I don't have any concept of like, oh, I lost my actual child or like some dubbing in of emotions, you know. I just understand the love of that as a mother. And I can bring that depth of holy shit, what that would, the loss. But I didn't play the loss, I played the love. Because the love I really understand. Or the lioness that comes out as a mother. Rachel, you would really understand that. Definitely. But yeah, I just try and really be a person. Of course, in fear and in the Walking Dead universe, there's this like greater mythology that defines the genre, which is a stroke of paint color that's extra for me anyway, when I'm creating the character or going through these scenes. But you just try and find the truth of those moments, you know, when they're sort of heightened or whatever into the mythology. Because all of you, the fans already are in a belief system of the mythology. So you don't have to play any of that. You just have to play the truth of that human being because in the end I want to create an emotional impact upon the audience and make the viewer feel emotions they've maybe never felt or tap into emotions they have that they hadn't or have them think new thoughts as a result of having this emotional feeling that leads them into a new creative breath in their own life in some way, shape or form. That's what I enjoy about acting is creating that emotional impact and having people relate and find their own humanity in what I'm doing with my character and we connect our humanities and go on a journey together. That's what I love doing. So I always try and find ways to connect as much to human truth and that empathy of understanding what someone's going through and the fun of inventing nuances about it. And there's so much with these scripts that's not on the page per se, but you have to understand all of the connective tissue of what you guys always talk about. It's an understanding of that in a scene. It makes it where there's like a gajillion ways to play a scene. All would be appropriate, but you also have to kind of go, well, there's a greater mythology here about, say, help with like how John Dory helped Morgan. Morgan helped, you know, there's like a connective pay it forward of help. That's a theme. That's what it is for me is not so much about how much of me is in it, just understanding that human being that I'm portraying and making them yeah. a person. That, that completely makes that makes sense. sense. And, and where... 
when you have the opportunity to have a connection with the character, you know, it, it probably helps. I dislike this as well, so it's going to be easy for me to display that. It's also fun, though. You get to you get to live things you have never lived yet. You get to have experiences you always dreamed about, but it's not really what's in your life. And you get to like live these lives. You get to live multiple lifetimes kind of in one lifetime as an mm-hmm. actor, and I find that really fun. I mean, it's kind of the same as a fan because as a fan, you can enjoy watching things that you would never enjoy watching in real life. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Who wants to live through a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> the satisfaction of putting a bullet through Virginia's brain. I would never want to watch it in real life. No. <laughs> Which is funny because... <laughs> Nor what I want to do in real life. <laughs> because isn't that the thing, too? Because like you're describing, uh, you know, our quote-unquote good guys can break bad, and then our hmm. bad guys can quote-unquote be good or understandable (laughs) and so that's kind of what makes what you're saying all the better and all the richer and i think that is in some ways a byproduct of fear the walking dead too in particular like really harness the homogeneity of the anti-hero or anti-villain or which what i call the anti-villain you know they're not that bad (laughs) so well everybody's bad sometimes i think that's what having zombies and the walkers it keeps the environment so dangerous when people get stressed out who who do they become you know we've all seen variations on a theme over the last year and a half of humanity and within our own families and circles of friends how people react when they're under these stresses and do they kind of become the superhero that can lift the car off of the person do they kind of turn selfish what's the range and dynamics of their willingness to help and be of service I think that's a fun exploration of humanity. And I think everybody has all of those moments. You know, sometimes you can rise up, sometimes you want to, and you can't because there's just some other force at work. And it's fun to explore all of those mm-hmm. shape shifting moments of high stakes survival. Yeah. And all of it's valid, like you were saying before, like yeah. without judgment. I'm sure June mm-hmm. never expected to be a sharpshooter working in the hospital and the ICU. She never right. thought, oh, I'm going to be a sharpshooter one day. So. Just never know where it's going to take you. And necessity does drive a lot of this. I've been enjoying that in terms of June's evolution, watching necessity being the mother of invention in terms of not just inventing solutions, but inventing abilities Mm -hmm. within yourself and harnessing them and having to call them into action or find them. You know, she made John teach her how to fish and she is someone who likes to attain and absorb knowledge so that she can be Mm -hmm. more competent. I think that is definitely a mo for her so recently sharon and i watched uh, imaginary mary which was so stinking cute <laughs> so <laughs> funny we, it was especially funny to see you playing a role of someone who basically had no idea what to do with kids <laughs> obviously it's you know acting but was there any special challenges uh, pretending not to know anything about kids. When I first got that script, I was like, okay, what is the lens she's looking at her life through that I can wrap my head around for myself? What does it feel like when you are faced with a situation that demands an ability you don't have? And do you even want it? What I did for that role is I just pulled way into a more selfish point of view that I don't get to in life. Because in life, I'm constantly having to make sacrifices. (laughs) And I was like, ooh, I just get to relish in like selfishness. (laughs) And I was like, I'm just gonna like lean into like me, 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 me for the role. So that then when the kids come at me, it's like, ah, ah. Ah, and it just feels like I'm being like attacked. Ah, you're interrupting my me, me, me narcissism as this character. So that's that's what I did on that was I'm just going to luxuriate in selfishness, which is also very much not my MO. Um, so that was just a fun way to do it. Yeah, it was probably fun for a little while though, right? Until they say cut and my kids are on set and wanting something. With their, with their arms crossed. Like, no, one more, one more, one more take. Come on, one more take. Um, where's craft service? <laughs> Burritos. <laughs> Hashtag <favorite> cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question is a fan question from Thomas at Celtic TSO. Mm-hmm. He asks, who from Dharma and Greg would last longest in the apocalypse and who would die the quickest? <laughs> oh, I feel like there's a few of the parents that would die the quickest for different reasons. <laughs> because I think Larry would like try and somehow like want to like vibe with the zombies, you know, and then would just like get eaten. <laughs> 
come on, man. Can't we get along? <laughs> hey, what's them? that? This is interesting. <laughs> yeah, they'd just be like, oh, Kitty would just literally shatter. Literally, her head would explode and overwhelm. Greg's father would probably accidentally somehow fall into some amazing opportunity that when he would survive <laughs> just by like dumb accident. You know who I think would survive the longest is Dharma's best friend, Jane. I think she'd do really well. Yes. Yeah, in, yeah. In one episode, she already had the leather jacket and the bat so she was already yes. ready to be Negan. <laughs> yeah, she's already <laughs> Negan. That's right. She's prepared. She was the OG. We have another fan question. This one's from my mom, Chris B. Oh, mama. In the movie Keeping the Faith, there's a scene where you are crying really, really hard. And she wants to know, is it easy for you to make the tears come out? Or is there a trick that you have for crying scenes? I think for Keeping the Faith, I had my makeup artist. It's a little like these little menthol crystals in a little stick that you can blow through. And your breath goes through and then it blows menthol air into the eye oh. which then makes it get all burny and teary and it actually activates your sinuses like when you cry how you get snot and everything it just turns all that on oh. and so i just had her blow in my eyes before the com comedic <laughs> scenes and then and then once you feel it happening so that was in the comedic ones there's a scene in keeping the faith where I'm having that scene with Ben Stiller where I'm trying to convince him and he's just like, I don't think there's room in this for what I believe. And it's a that was actual crying because Edward, he made the choice to direct me in that scene by coming up to this close in my face and saying my lines, my entire monologue to me this close to my face. Ooh. And I would like pull away so that I could actually see. And then he'd sort of pull me in. So he was like shoving my space in as a direct approach mm. but he didn't tell me that's what he was going to be doing so I was like very confused what was happening and with each take that he did that I was getting more and more upset I was getting so upset that I was trying not to cry in the scene and it was all it worked beautifully we had a few words about that scene. <laughs> um, <laughs> on fear that is all me because I just get it I have those feelings I feel so much about June I feel so much about the journey and the story that when I'm in those scenes, it really is just happening for me because I feel all of it as June. So it just depends. I think you mentioned something to the effect in some other interviews that you, in some respects, went back to school when it came to June. You know, it, like you kind of went back to the basics and built yourself up again to play the role of June. Is it? Does that kind of play into what you're talking about, that that's all you? What you said about going back to basics and sort of building myself up artistically again is absolutely true. Maybe that falls into um, the emotion and connectivity to June, just because I've, I have, I care so much about it. And I invest a lot of um, time working on my scripts. And for me, the, the going back to basics was just, this isn't just a drama. It's like, this is a whole thing fear and the walking dead universe it's unlike any acting experience i have ever had it was a real learning curve and understanding how these stories work and how best to communicate these stories through the characters like i said there's like so many ways to portray a scene sometimes but in this it's like you have to think with the greater themes a bit and that kind of drives you know it's not just like an actor going how do i want to play this scene it's like you you have to really really understand mm. story really understand this story the greater story and that just took like a lot of trial and error it's still continuing because june's evolving and june is having experiences that change her you know after the, each sort of cathartic thing that changes her and shifts her i kind of go into a new moment of creativity and inspiration for what that next trajectory is for her. Like, you know, 609, when I kill Virginia, when I lost John, 608 to 609 was a huge transformation for, for oh, June. Yes. And and mm -hmm. feeling all of those things, you know, it was actually leading leading up to it. June started getting this independence, a little more independence from John and not relying on him so much for what we're gonna do. I could feel in the scenes having a bit more self-determinism over what we're doing uh, together. And, and so then when I lost him, there's so many things that does to a person. I don't want to make Rachel cry, but I'm specifically talking about <laughs> acting. You, you just got to lean rough. in. It, it's it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. But it was a very fun opportunity to transform and go through this transformation. 
and leading into killing Virginia and what that did to June. And is June just totally fine with the loss of John? Like, just because she killed Virginia? That's not how that works, you know? But she does have more ownership over her own space because she has to. She has to think for herself. She has to drive her own survival. And I like that. I like finding these, like, bric-a-brac moments of increased confidence of of June. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate... I hate that John died, obviously, but I am mm. happy to see where that lets June go because I kind mm-hmm. of felt, I mean, as much as I love John and June, June was just an extension of John. And now that John mm-hmm. is gone, June can expand into somebody completely new and completely different. Yeah. And finding where John sits in her, mm-hmm. but also she was a full woman before him, mm-hmm. got very broken with a lot of loss. And he filled a void in her and that brought her into a more fulfilled state. And then losing him, she's going to have to rebuild herself, but she's got some tools for that now because Mm. of him. There's always him within her in that way, but she has to move forward. And what she does always have in her back pocket is the ability to help others. And that's always keeps her sane. And when she goes off of that, she starts going off of her sanity. Uh, This was a very heated debate on the podcast. Can you see June in another romantic relationship or is John it for her? I don't think that she'd be like running to fill a void or replace John like some woman that like has to have a man to like know where she's at at all. But I think that she's an open enough person that if something were to come around that somehow was newly an enhancement, I don't know why that would be a bad thing. I don't think she's the type of person that's like, if it's not him, then nobody. This isn't a normal world. This is a world that's all can go to shit at any time like you can die at any moment and i think that's one of the things that's been established is to live in the present moment and to be present because you do not know what the next moment is going to bring and all you can control at any time ever is the present moment and that's why gaining abilities and competence is important in this universe and in real life because really you have present and you can make the future better by how you're handling the present so i think she knows that I think that's been a style. That's why they got married. You know, it's like, let's make the most of right now, always. Mm. So I think that if someone were to come by that somehow filled her and made what's happening in the present moment better, and they could make the world better together. Like, I don't think she'd be like, go away. I can't have it. Because <laughs> I think she firmly knows that any anything that's enhancing has value in this world. It's a commodity. I, I want to say two things before we continue. Oh, Do you, one. Are you striving to be right about something right now, Dave? <laughs> nope, because I'm already because I'm already right. <laughs> okay, no, no. I'll stay I, out I want, of it. I wanted to say first, um, the our reasoning, both of our reasoning, was all well intentioned. I, I just wanted to say that and clear the air because yeah, because we all. I mean, my reasoning was exactly like yours. I live in the present moment. You never know what's going to happen next. Cetera, Rachel cetera, doesn't cetera. fully agree with you. Oh, right, right, right. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> Dave, Dave basically said what you did, but you just said it so much better. <laughs> exactly. It just came exactly. from your it came from your face, so it's better accepted. Well, she, she, ex- she explained it so much better. You know? and, oh, 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 it's the explanation. I, I see. Yeah, yeah. You um, know, and John. No, but. John but it all comes loves, from a good p- place. That's John the thing. loves June enough that he would want her to be happy too. Like yes. This. Yeah. No. I think so. I think we he could John. have it. I don't think it'd be a betrayal. No. It, that was the word, wasn't it? The, <laughs> the betrayal. That was the word, wasn't it? Wasn't it, ladies? Anyways, so. well, I think right. in a normal world that's not the apocalypse, there is something to be said for the process of honoring certain experiences. But in an apocalypse, let alone a nuclear one, you don't have the luxury of those kinds of things. So I think that that's where the necessity comes up. Anything that enhances survival in that way is highly, highly valuable. In an interview once, I heard you say something like, you chose June's hairstyle because it didn't require a lot of heat treatment. Mm -hmm. So that got me to wondering, how much input do you have into June's style and what she wears and accessories and stuff like that? Yeah, well, it's definitely a collaborative process. Um, the wardrobe designer usually presents a few choices. I'm very open. I don't try and make decisions or, or judge by what's on the rack because I'm often just wrong. You have to go through that process mm. and 
you know, the wardrobe designer, they have the scripts long before we do as actors. So they've been with the material and they know the broader story. I admire their abilities. So I just, I put on different things. I let them take all, you know, we photograph each outfit. They send them to the producers. If I feel strongly, I say, I really like this based on the information I have, or she'll say why she feels one or the other. Sometimes I'll say like the bracelet she had put in our very first fitting, she had a couple bracelet choices just for what Whatever. It's just there. And then I saw that infinity symbol, which I love the concept of infinite things anyway, um, as a broader theme. I just like that concept. But it had a childlike quality on it. And I went, ah, that was roses. And I'm going to have that on me at all times. And and then I think some of the fans have been like, well, how did she get it if Rose turned and took down the FEMA shelter? But that woman was in the truck. Because I had asked the producers, how did I find out what happened? And we saw her in the truck in season four, and I had to put her, kill her. But she was the one who taught me JIC just in case. And she was outside when I came back, and she's the one who told me what happened. And I just decided she gave that to me at that point. And so I like always having a part. Plus June's guilt uh, about that FEMA shelter is something that definitely lives within her. That's a horrible, horrible situation. What happened at the FEMA shelter and June's guilt over that. And, you know, her wanting to help everyone find a place. There's certain things that she feels like she needs to make right in the world to counteract what happened at the FEMA shelter. She wants to make those amends in the, in the universe and refulfill a huge human void that she feels responsible for. And there was some evolution in terms of taking on John's hat because I had my hair pulled back as a choice always. She wants to help people. So that's her thing. And then when this happened with John and I get dragged from the cabin to the, when we're all kneeling and at gunpoint, this has all happened all in, you know, one night she's kneeling there. And then we arrive at Eden where Morgan is on horseback. And it's just like, she showered and just like, and just got on the horse and went so many horrors in one 24 hour period. And it changed her priorities a little bit. Not like helping people isn't a priority, but she just was going through something. And it, I just like the visual symbology of the change with my hair in that knob. It didn't actually fit on my head. I couldn't put the hat on. And then I like tried lowering the knob and that just like looked weird. And then I was like, wait a minute, let's walk through this. What really happened? And I was like, oh, she showered all the fucking blood and dirt and sweat off and then had to get on the horse and go. And she's depressed mm -hmm. and she's down and she's not pulling her hair back, getting ready to help anybody. Too much yeah. effort. And then that just kind of stuck. Even her hair is sad. And I, I love how even that, in some senses, makes June more balanced. Because, you know, like you said, June is always rolling her sle sleeves up, uh, pulling her hair back, just ready to help. And then mm -hmm. having to stop almost balances her out in some ways. What was the thing that I said in the beginning of the season? June could run this mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Even that one modification makes that even more apt getting closer to a life of balance makes you kind of a, a person who could free up their hands and do anything that they need to do. Mm -hmm. And if she ever needed to tie her back, her hair back again up and ha just be that helper person, she could always do that. But for now, I'm going to live Zen. Zen AF. Yeah, and it also might take her backwards into a time with John that maybe she doesn't really want to go to. June has also been wearing the same jeans since season four with the <laughs> hole in the leg. <laughs> Okay. Yes, yes, yes. There's a few sizes of those jeans, depending on my uh, water retention at any yeah. given time. Because if we film after lunch and we have incredible caterers, I am so water retentive, I have to go up. Oh my goodness. Um, and, and there's some portions of the season where I'm slightly thinner, and there's some after a hiatus where I'm a little thinner. And so... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we have, uh, I think we have three sizes, you know, we've got the size 27s, which was sort of the end of season four. <laughs> We've got the size 28s and we've got the size 29s, which I've been in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just going to stay muted. Yeah. <laughs> And good, good choice. <laughs> then we have like multiple pairs because if I have to get wet and then, the yeah. net, and then that afternoon we're shooting a scene where I haven't gotten yeah. wet yet, we have to switch out. And also after lunch, what's great, if it's after lunch and we have to switch out to a dry pair, I can say, bring the 20. <laughs> this has been a very funny conversation in many wardrobe fittings. <laughs> And over walkie-talkies, like, uh, Jenna, need, Jenna needs the 29s. <laughs> and I'm like, are these the 27s? <laughs> and and she's like, Naima, my, my on-set stylist, she's like, 
Nope. <laughs> I'm like, they're the 29s and they're this tight. And she's like, I was like, <laughs> oh, no. okay. 2020. When was the, mo the moment, if there was a moment, when you knew you just had to be June Dory? Well, it's funny because she was Naomi when it was pitched to me. <laughs> yeah. It's a good question. I knew I was like, yes, without even a lag when they offered it to me in the first place, because it is exactly what I had been wanting to do. Like 10 days prior, I finally sorted out for myself what I wanted to do artistically. And then like, boom, they call. But it was all kind of like they're reworking the show a bit. And there's new showrunners. and They're bringing on Garrett Dillahunt. And that's all the kind of information we have. But we want to set a Zoom or a Skype call with Scott Gimple. And he'll walk you through like the character and what it is. And he walked me through who she was, her backstory. And I was just like, everything about it rang true of something that I'd be interested in. There was never much hesitation, really. The concept I liked. And then when Gimple was walking me through it, I was like, uh, this is like incredible. Yes, I'm interested in this exploration. June is different from most characters you've played before. How did you prepare to step into this different kind of role? I immediately started watching every episode of The Walking Dead and Fear the Walking Dead. And then I went to Austin, got there a few days early to get oriented with fittings and all that stuff. And I didn't leave my hotel room for about four days. I was going over the script. I was watching episodes. I went for a lot of walks. It's something I like to do anyway. I go for a walk as the character. I've done it for almost every character I've ever done. I work on it. I'm, you know, reading and all of the mental kind of creative bits and pieces and construction of a universe for that character. And then I take the character and I just go walking as the character. And I look at the world from those eyes and I start finding places where they pull in. I find the kinetic relationship in the body of the character to the world around me. And it kind of gives me like a physical orientation to where I'm sitting as the character in the world around me. And then another thing, because I never played a role like this, I had to kind of sell myself on it too. And I remember Garrett, we were sort of sharing notes a little bit like as actors. I like took my brown eyeshadows and stuff and bronzers and dirtied up my face like I was in the apocalypse and I just stood in front of the mirror and like went yeah okay and then I was running my lines and working on the character in my hotel room all messed up and <laughs> feeling all of that because I had to just get in that skin I've never been in that skin before what is the apocalypse and we've not lived in apocalypse like I had no point of reference on where all those losses and desires for survival where that hangs in your face even you know and where all of that lives so it was a really like like, I think as my with my dance training, it's a very kinetic thing for me as well. It's like I have to connect into the character's body and find all that. And lots of walks as the character. And I'd look at the world around me from that viewpoint. And then I'd go back and work some more. And then I'd go for another walk with that sort of next level of understanding. And I just sat in my in my hotel room and I didn't leave. Just doing that for like four straight days before my first day of filming. And then I also, I knew that, you know, they don't eat much. There's not like robust meals in the apocalypse. So so I lowered my calorie intake because it changes your feeling of your body. It makes you more alert when you're a little bit hungry. It changes your relationship within your body. And I found that positioned me within my body in a certain way that helped me portray sort of someone who is in this situation. And I don't feel as connected to the story when uh, with a full belly while I'm working. But sometimes the catering's so good, I can't help it. <laughs> but um, yeah, that I have found actually really helps me just to be a little bit hungry when I'm on set working, which is really uncomfortable because I love to eat and I love food. I admire that the front loading and bootstrapping of this character as much as much as possible. And then all of a sudden you're there and you're, you're playing out this role, you're feeling it out as you're doing it. And I wonder, because as much as you try to inhabit this person that you're trying to portray, right? At a certain point, you can only do so much, the cameras hit, you start getting direction. There must have been a certain point, maybe during filming, maybe during watching, that you felt like you got a swing, like you, you're upswing, like, oh, I'm really connecting with this character now that everything is coming into place. What was that for you? It's really on and off. Sometimes you'll have a whole interpretation of how the scene's gonna play out and you show up and Mikey will literally have the exact opposite energy of how he, <laughs> of how he sees it going. And you're like, oh! 
like when I'm waiting for John to show up at the cabin with Virginia, right? And I'm waiting and I'm like, call more Rangers. What's going on? It was written. I'm sitting at the table with the medical supplies waiting. And so I worked on it like that. And then I showed up and Mikey was like, all right, so I want you pacing around the room. You can rip the curtains off. You're like a caged animal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the cameras are ready. And I was like, wow, ah. you just got to be like on your toes. Now I've gotten used to Mikey and I know how he works. Even if he's not directing an episode, he's such a hero of mine aesthetically for this show. I think about how would Mikey direct this scene even before I show up with a different director, just so that I know <laughs> that I'm framing it in the most aligned way. I mean, I work on it as my, my character, but how is this scene move the story forward? What is the energy of this scene? What is the tone, the emotion, the velocity or not of this scene? And who is changed in this scene? Which character and who does the changing? Who's different by the end? And how does that move the story forward? And really understanding and analyzing that. And sometimes you also show up, and I'm sure I've done this for other actors and given them a huge problem, which is the actors around you might be portraying it in a completely different way mm -hmm. than you read it. They're not playing it in a way that would facilitate that being a logical response. I also, when I was getting ready for this, I watched Helen Mirren's masterclass. That's something also she talks about. People ask her, what's it like to work with this actor or that actor that you've worked with? And she's like, you know, rarely am I on camera with the actor in the same thing. You do like your master, but then it's like cutting and your single shots. She goes, my co-stars are my camera operators and it's a very intimate relationship. And boy, was she right. I developed this incredible relationship with our steady cam and, and B camera operator, Juan Ramos and, and the focus puller, Theta. I would turn on something and I could feel Juan would like zoom in. He'd see me do that. And I could feel Theta just go shunk right into the focus. And boy, <laughs> you're telling story right there. And it's yeah. a very, very special relationship. And I never had that before because in comedy and stuff, that's not a thing. But yeah, you have to sort of really do a lot of work so that you're ready to roll in any which way, which was also new muscles I had to gain. So what was the absolute most fun scene for you to shoot on Fear the Walking Dead? Oh God, that is really hard. <laughs> From the photos that we see, it looks like you guys have a lot of fun on set. Mm -hmm. Yes. Usually what makes a scene fun for me is the fulfillment creatively that I get out of it when I'm doing it. And there's a lot because I love what I do. It's a hard one to answer. And there's different reasons why I love things because I grow from them or learn or if it's horribly hard or I did bad and then I watched it and then I learned how I could do it better. Then it becomes my favorite scene because I learned something. Most fun to film artistically, I'd have to answer. I have to say that sequence of walking away after shooting Virginia, I could feel within me the shift and it was really fun doing that shift. And there was two different setups to shoot it. One was the like actually coming out the door, which we shot first. And then we shot the leaving the chapel mm -hmm. and doing the walk to the door. The funny part was I was trying to be all like doing my thing and the gravel, what I'm walking on, there's just like so oh. many rocks. <laughs> and so my feet were like, Mikey was like trying to direct me and I'm, like tripping and my ankles are like, you know, and I'm like, this is not cool. Mikey's like, and so then I decided to like kind of try and pick my feet up. If you step down on things as opposed to walking this way, I don't know. So, and he's like, it's like you're marching. Can you do it differently? I was like, no, I'm trying not to like trip. The most simple scene that was like so ridiculously challenging. But then that one where I'm walking and everyone, all the characters are watching her leave and just that giving no fucks from someone who normally is emoting a lot of care and empathy. It was just such a change. I just found that really fun and liberating also to not care what anybody thought of me. We felt the change mm -hmm. when June was walking out of the chapel too. Boom, right off the screen. It was cathartic for me as an individual, a person, an actress, a character. I, I really, really loved that. Oh, you know what else was really fun? Is in season five on the horse, uh, herding all of the walkers. Oh, that yes. was so fun. <laughs> I have to say that was, that was unbelievably fun. I didn't want it to end. Pat the horse. Pat, yeah. Pat the teenage brat. That's <laughs> oh. what he was. Oh. Little BTS <laughs> on Pat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got uh, Boudreaux for uh, season six and he was like a Rolls Royce. That was amazing. If you could change one thing about June, what would it be? Moving forward that I, I think would be fun within her is just seeing more of that toughness or that integrity aspect within her. I'd like to just evolve on that. I find that really interesting for her. Uh, I had a theory that June was going to become the big bad in season six. Did not pan mm -hmm. out, of course. 
But would you have been okay <laughs> with her going to the dark side and becoming a, a baddie? I don't know if it made sense for the story. If John being murdered didn't do that to her, it would take a lot. Because I, I just think she has enough integrity to not, and enough orientation to her own purpose in life, to not let her slide down into ultimate darkness. But if it was somehow connected truly and warranted in a way where I really was like, mm-hmm. oh, I could see how this... Yeah. It would have to take immense betrayal i think to really shift her into something that is not who she is and of course i would do it Mm -hmm. if it made sense for the story and was something i could really wrap my head around but i just don't think that that's ultimately really who she is i don't either i just thought it was an interesting theory (laughs) powers for good is kind of where her heart is that was another slightly heated discussion (laughs) (laughs) doing the wrong thing for the right reasons it's that I, I also like my, my June on the good side, so. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we put that one to bed pretty quickly, though. We, sounds like a cocktail. Like, I'll have June on the good side, please. <laughs> right. And Sharon, you'll take the dark June. <laughs> the dark I'll take, side of I'll June. take any yeah. June. Dark I'd June on the rock. any June. <laughs> Can we get that contract, that lifetime contract? <laughs> no, anyways. <laughs> No, and it's funny that you say all this. When we were talking before about John making June better, I think of, immediately think of Kintsugi, the uh, filling the cracks with gold. Mm -hmm. John has this indelible mark on June, and it in turn kind of makes her a different person, the sharpshooter. This this shift in tone is not only, well, it's mostly June, but then there's also that, well, what does John leave behind in her to enable her to be another variant of that strong June that I've seen throughout. I feel like we're getting closer to expressing more and more of that, but I think it was always there. Yeah, I think so too. I think I 100% agree with you. Would you audition or read for the role of a villain on like any other project? Oh, hell yes. Those are fun to play. <laughs> of course. I don't have any judgment on that. I just like a good story and a fun character. I don't care what form that takes as long as it's stimulating and interesting and fun. Yeah. I would just love to see you play the, the baddest villain. Oh, like yeah. Some serial killer or something. I don't know. Just something. The true villain. I would love to see that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. June has been teamed up with John, John Sr., Al, and Sarah. Who would you like to see June teamed up with next? Carol and Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we say something like yes. this? I feel like we've said this. <laughs> and then Rachel dies. <laughs> Immediately. Best answer yeah. ever. <laughs> <laughs> we have another fan question from Charlotte at Under the Feather. Mm. If June had a soundtrack, what songs would be on it? Tom Petty's I Won't Back Down. Etta James's At Last. Okay, now I'm crying. I'm <laughs> Some really awesome Van Halen song, just because. And probably a bunch of Chicago blues. We had a few. Yeah, I'd um, love to Bad hear. Bad to the Bone. Uh-huh, sure. George Thorogood. Yeah. Doctor, Doctor, Give Me the News. <laughs> Can't remember the name of the song. <laughs> yeah. These boots are made for walking. Yeah, yeah, that's These a good boots one. are made for walking. That's a good yeah. one, yeah. Bad Blood. Bad Blood. Oh, yeah. 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 That was this, yours and, yeah. you, uh, June and Ginny's theme song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's good. I like that. <laughs> what have you taken away from playing June? Mmm. So much. How do I articulate that? Such a beautiful question. This is such a fulfilling time in my life. I am so grateful with every scene I play. I'm learning. I'm trying new things. Oh my God. And for season seven, I am just like spending ungodly hours working on my script. I wanted to challenge myself. And I always worked on my script, but I just decided to like consistently just ratchet it up to find out what higher level I could absorb of the story and nuance. In one of the episodes, I spent like 12 hours before I did my first day and then I'd shoot and I'd come home and spend three hours that night on the next scenes for the next day. And I'm finding that that is really upping my game. The big takeaways, I just feel so enhanced artistically. I feel like I'm growing and learning and challenging myself, accomplishing things and not accomplishing things so I can then find out why I didn't and then improve it. And just that whole process is enhancing. And every day I just feel so grateful to 
be on set. Every script that comes my way that's got my name in it, it's like Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever joyful moment of abundance that people conceive. I don't take it for granted. And I think that's kind of what it's meant to me is just growth and evolution and that I can be turning 50 this year and feeling like I'm just beginning. And that's very, very fulfilling. Picture yourself 25 years prior. Did you imagine it would be like this? Or did you imagine you would be here? No, I dreamed of it. I think I never thought anyone would give me the chance or see me in this way or give me this kind of opportunity at all. Well, I would dream it. Like I'd watch films that had characters like this and be like, I want to have the opportunity to inhabit that space. I knew I had that within me, but I just didn't think anyone would see me that way. And so that's why when they called and offered me this role, I just was like, (laughs) because I couldn't (laughs) believe that they would have that kind of faith in me to bring this to life and to give me that opportunity and to trust in me to portray this meant so much to me and it still does every breathing minute. You know, it's funny. I asked the question because in some ways we we picture ourselves even in flights of fancy, a certain way when we achieve this sort of goal, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we're finally here, all we're focused is on the work and improving (laughs) ourselves, right? And so I try to kind of connect with our guests in our own experiences as a podcast. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, that's right. I just want to make the most out of it. I think that was something that's a a disease of youth is to take things for granted. Because when you're young, you just think if you have something great, you just think it's always going to be that way. Oh, this is my life. You know, and you don't, you know, after Dharma and Greg, it was like, like a bumpy, awkward second puberty. Like I just was like, who am I? What kind of work am I going to do? Huh? How do you compare to Dharma? I don't know. Uh, I was definitely at a watershed moment. I think I was considering quitting acting, like for sure. I don't know if I can tolerate this anymore. So that's why it just meant all the more when people spoke with me and they offered me the role and it just meant that they had faith in me. And that felt really, really reassuring and And it made me just want to work all the more to keep earning my place of this beautiful privilege. And I definitely identify with that 100%. Now that you're here, you want to make the most of it. And you just want to give everything and just be productive. And I I love that. (laughs) (laughs) If you could choose any other actor to bring on to fear, who would it be? There are so many wonderful artists in the world. You know who I think would be cool, just because he's such a good actor and I've worked with him, is Edward Norton. After watching American History X, the idea of some kind of intensity like that in a character and how firmly he held his position in space as that character and how threatening and um, upsetting and intense that was. I just think something like that with that caliber of a performance could be really cool. Those questions just make me like go, no, nothing to you. I just get like, I don't know. <laughs> like, there's so many brilliant actors. We were picking out other people too that we'd like to see in fear too. Thomas Gibson. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. That would be a little awkward though, I think. I-, I couldn't do scenes with him because people would only see Darman and Greg like in the apocalypse. Like it would be super weird. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, that, that that's probably true. You could be a walker. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So have you ever accepted a role or even maybe been in a scene that you realized just wasn't a good fit? Have you ever had to speak up and say, I don't want to do this? <laughs> yeah, well, I've never like not done something once I took it because I think that there's a responsibility once you take something to do your best. I think sometimes I, I've taken things of which I won't name where my concept of what it was going to be, I didn't feel like I could fulfill that, not blaming the writing, it's just the concept of the story or character, the way they were doing it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Oh, this is like totally like a different cadence of character. Oh, that's not what I thought. And 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 there's so many chefs in the kitchen, especially on like network comedies and stuff. You've got what the writer wants to communicate and then depending on their stature, you have what the network wants to put out out there and then it's kind of sometimes can be a war of who wins and then sometimes it can be like well we'll let you have this one but we want this too many chefs in the kitchen can just obliterate an aesthetic concept and and actually chop the communication of what the piece should be and what it was intended to be
be to where it's like got no communication. You're like, what am I? Wa I don't even know what this is about because it just gets so adjusted by people who don't know what they're doing. You know, if they're not writers and then the writers are not maybe of a stature where they can be like, uh, no, or at a network that doesn't really let the creatives be the creative. That's mainly the thing. Too many chefs in the kitchen between network, studio, writers, producers, it's obliterated and is unidentifiable from the thing you signed on to do. What's the best piece of life advice that you can give us or that you live by yourself? The two sides of the coin of the golden rule. Just try to treat people the way you would want to be treated. And then the other side is like trying not to do things to others that you wouldn't want done to you. And that's not always easy because we all have blind spots. We don't estimate the person in front of us properly. And so we communicate in a way they cannot have at all. And we just like missed it. Having that kind of be the guiding lens that you look at life through, I think that gets you through many things. It, it makes you consider more. And I, I just find I kind of always come back to that one. There are not enough thank yous in the world to give to you for being here today. Thank you so, so much for giving us your time. And I can say without a doubt, this will absolutely be one of the best days of my life forever. So Aww. thank you so much for being Aww. here. Aww. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. Thank Thanks, you. guys. I felt like this should have happened a long time ago. So <laughs> let me just say, I'm sorry for not only you, Jenna, but, you know, the rest of our fans who listen and have been waiting for this for a very long time. It's just one of those things. But you know what? It's funny. It happened at the right time. It felt like all the pieces fit. Well, we can just sum it up with John Dory, what he kept saying and that he got from his father, John Dory Sr., which is, it's never too late. Ooh. That is it. That's where the recording it the whole stops. Time without crying. <laughs> <laughs> well, if not now, it, it, it would have happened later. It's it's fine. <laughs> Thank you guys. I so appreciate it. I love you so much. Love you. Thank love you, you so much for making me feel welcome in this world. Thank you. Well, thank you for always Thank doing you. the same. You are amazing. I. I wish there yes. were better words to use. The attention that you give the fandom, it just, it means so much to us. You're very articulate, Rachel. You are very articulate. Thank you, really. That's exactly what she needed to hear right now. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys, you, talk soon. Stop. I'm so embarrassed for you right now.